The more the wall hungered, the more that the enemy bled. The more that the enemy bled, the more the wall hungered. Greetings and welcome to the Dream Syndicate. In today's video, we're going to be making Lord Bledwell, a mixed media art doll. So let's get crafting. I started out by sketching some different versions of the Lord Bledwell character and played around with his color and design. I've always loved the more villainous characters, and with this guy I was probably drawing some inspiration from the Witch King of Angmar from Tolkien, and maybe a little Shredder from the Ninja Turtles. Can we just take a moment to respect what a nearly perfect film the 90s Turtles movie is? First we'll take this little ball of tinfoil and wrap some clay around it. This is going to be a thin-necked character, so we'll use a piece of aluminum tubing that's going to help us attach his head to his body later. We'll rough out the basic shape and refine it as we go. Next we'll dot in the location for the eyes with a small ball stylus. I'll put links to where you can find the supplies I'm using in the description and pinned comment. And since I love making characters with light bulb or skull shaped heads, we'll give Lord Bledwell that shaped head as well. We'll add on oblong pieces for the cheeks and blend that in. Another thing I tend to like in my characters are deep set eyes, so we'll go ahead and smooth in eye sockets here. I thought these resin eyes would look cool, being this sort of pink, animalistic eye, but I ended up taking them out when I decided I wanted more of a beady eyed look for the art doll. Instead, we'll be using some pre baked original Sculpey balls of clay for the eyes. I usually make a bunch of different sizes of these at a time and keep some on hand. Next, we'll add a little clay strip for each lower eyelid and start to blend that down. We can use our clay tool to put in some of the various folds and wrinkles of the eye. A lot of times I have a tendency to make a character's forehead too flat, so I'm bulking it out. We'll sculpt upper eyelids from slightly larger clay strips than the lower lids, putting in little furrows and lines to give us the tiny wrinkles of the eyelid. Now we'll place a long strip for the nose, and use our tools to blend it in. Once it's blended, we'll use this flat-ended tool to refine the planes of the nose. Then we'll quickly mark in where we'll place the ears. Though it's probably more realistic, I didn't like the amount of mass on the back of the head, so we'll chop some of that off and blend the rest in. We'll add a little ball of clay to form the tip of the nose. And so far I'm liking the profile of this character. We'll go ahead and add a little ball of clay to either side of his nose. If you want to join me in making new imaginary reality, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Once that's blended, we can use a small ball stylus to carve in his nostrils. Now we'll go in and refine the angles of the cheeks and the upper lip area. And we'll also go in and strengthen the lines of the mouth. I'm thinking I'm going to give him a wrinkly skin texture. Lord Bloodwall makes me think of undead monsters like a lich or a vampire, so I wanted to play up his creepiness. We'll make little cuts to help join the two pieces of clay for the ears. Here I'm scoring the inside of the ear. And then we'll take our clay tool and blend the pieces. I'm going to give them an ear reduction, so I'll pull off some of the clay and push it back into shape. It's still kind of loosely attached, so we'll add a small ball of clay to the back of each ear. Give that little bone bump behind your ear so it works anatomically. Next we'll go in and carve in the spiral kinds of shapes people have in their inner ears. Making convincing inner ear swirls can be tricky, so you might want to look at reference photos and copy them. Here we'll take a second to reinforce the line where the ear connects to the head. And now we can see our art dolls looking a bit like a caricatured version of Mr. Spock, Leonard Nimoy. Now we're going to use a material that's fairly new to me, epoxy sculpt. I even made these super advanced popsicle sticks to not cross contaminate either of the two parts. What you do with this stuff is take some of part A and some of part B from each container so that they're equal and get them good and mixed up. I'm wearing gloves because it's probably a good idea to wear them anytime something goes through a chemical process while you're handling it. We'll roll out tiny shapes that we'll use for teeth, and I see this character having pieces of metal embedded in his face, so we'll make some little shapes for that. I'm not sure how epoxy sculpt's going to interact with the unbaked sculpey, so I guess we're going to find out together. We'll make this pointy goatee shape, which clearly means he's now evil Spock. And now we'll give him less conventional facial protrusions with these spiky bits coming out the sides of his face. What I really feel this guy needs is a couple more face spikes. Here we've been using our clay tool to put a bit more texture into the metal pieces so they're not just smooth. Lord Bledwall is also going to have bladed looking eyebrows. We'll carve in some lines to define the eyebrows and give them a pointy look. I also decided to put little plates across the top of his ears. 
So we'll use thin bits of epoxy sculpt across there. We'll use our tool to push it in and get a little texture on them. Lastly, for the metal plates, we're going to put a few across the back of his neck. We'll use our clay tool to refine the plate shape and add some texture there. You could use some forehead wrinkles, so let's add those real quick. We'll have the little tooth pieces to harden for a day, and now we can give this guy some teeth. This also means the other pieces we put on Lord Bloodwall are pretty firm by now. We'll make a hole for the tooth, put it in, and press the clay around it. With all the teeth in, we can see what kind of texture we want to put on his lips. We'll put in some last touches and give a little more definition on his brow. And then we'll start poking some holes around his head. In the sketch, I made a sort of crown out of embedded metal pieces, so we'll make some holes that will allow me to attach that to him. We start with a smaller pointy tool, and then we can go around with a small ball style and make the holes a little bigger. Here's Lord Bloodwall all ready for the oven. We'll bake his head for about 25 minutes at 275 degrees. This is a two-scale drawing that's pretty close to what the build should look like. The head's a little large, so I'll either have to scrap the sculpt or scale off the build a bit. I like how this is looking so far, so I'm definitely going with the latter. Let's start laying some paint on this guy. I started out using a dark purple undertone. I think it was something like a dioxide purple, and I found myself really liking the way it looked. I mean, there's so many cool purple villains. You've got Megatron from Beast Wars, Thanos, and the Grimace. So with that inspiration, let's make Lord Bloodwall purple. To get his base flesh tone, I'm using a mix of titanium white, a little ivory black, a lizard and crimson, cadmium red, and cobalt blue acrylic paints. Then we'll lay in this pink, which we're using to paint the inside of the eyelids more than anything else. I have this tube of silver paint I picked up maybe 10 years ago, so I guess we can call it antique. We can hit all the metal plate parts with this antique silver. If you use techniques you learn from any of my videos, I'd be happy to take a look. You can tag me on whatever social media platform you're posting to. You can find my links below. We'll just add a redder tone to his cheeks and forehead. Then we can make it a little warmer near the tip of his nose so it's more of a magenta color. And carry some of that onto his neck. We'll paint this duller, paler purple inside his ears. And along his upper lip. I'm going to try this blue purple on his lips, but we're probably going to take it darker later. A lot of times you kind of have to start trying to lay down colors before you can see how they relate to one another. We'll shade his face with a little bit of this dark, sort of gray-blue. Then carry some of that through under his chin, and then rinse some of that in by mixing in some of the purple base flesh tone. Now we'll go in and lighten along the inside of his nose. Here we'll see how we like a brighter tone for the eyes with this cadmium red. It's nice to keep a scrap of something like a poultry foam around when you need to set a painted head down. It'll reduce the odds the paint will scratch off. Let's get some more color variation happening and paint on this earthy orange tone and then paint that pale purple tone over top of it to have it blend. Next, we'll add the darker red across the bridge of the nose and other areas that would get the most sunlight on the face, like the cheeks and the forehead. Painting around his fangs here is a bit of a challenge. We'll use this light gray purple around his mouth. We'll take a fine brush and carefully paint on these black vertical slits. When I was thinking of the design of this character, I was kind of thinking of a crocodile. We'll just take a moment to lighten his upper eyelids. Now we'll take a pal tone similar to what we used around the mouth and put that down where the nose meets the face, also known as the infraorbital furrow, which I was today years old when I learned it was called that. Here we're drawing little diamond shapes that will form Lord Bloodwell's steel crown. The paper is actually a couple of pieces of heavier stock paper glued together to make it look and feel more substantial. When cutting out shapes with an X-Acto or utility knife, it's usually a lot easier to make several cuts rather than try to cut the piece away in one pass. We'll just check and see that we like how this looks. I'm into it, so we'll just use this as a template and trace another four times on our paper. I'm going to make the holes a little deeper with this hand drill. It works kind of like a screwdriver. You crank with your hand and it'll bore a hole out. You can use a regular electric drill or Dremel on Sculpey, but with how little area there was around where I wanted to put the holes, I didn't want a chance cracking it. It's also usually a much better idea to do your drilling before you paint. Once these are drilled, we're ready to paint them. We use that same silver from the face spikes. We'll paint all the one side, let it dry, and then do the other side, painting a couple layers. I like to keep plastic straps around the studio, like the kinds you get from food containers, to mix things in and whatnot. This time we're going to use the lid to lay down an ink wash from the metal bits to bring out the little texture details. So what we're going to do is generally apply the ink on all the pieces we painted that silver on. 
We want the ink to be kind of liquidy, but not put on so much in any area that we have to worry about it running onto areas where we definitely don't want it. You only want to leave the ink on for maybe a couple of minutes, and then take a paper towel or a q-tip and gently brush across the detail you're trying to accent. I ended up really liking the way the wash tinted all the metallic areas here, and did this process a couple of times to get a more aged metal look. Here we'll just brush two layers of gloss varnish on the lips and three on the eyes to get that shiny, alive quality to the sculpt. Now I'll just take a minute noodling with some finishing touches. It's sort of a last push to make the face look done to me. While I'm doing that, I'll tell you more about the character. I'm still working on the story of Lord Bloodwall, but I'm thinking of him as a manifest, which are basically wizards in the world I'm building. He rules a kingdom that was at war with a neighboring kingdom, and loses his son to the conflict. In his anger and grief, he happens upon a large, strange seed that calls to him. He nurtures it with his hatred and desire for revenge, and day by day, month by month, it grows into this bladed and barred barrier along his lands that comes to be called the Bleed Wall. The wall hungers and attacks friend and foe alike, maiming or killing anyone that comes within its lethal, sinuous reach. The Bleed Wall ever expands, and Lord Bloodwall ever becomes concerned with assuaging its bottomless hunger. This caused the majority of his kingdom's subjects to flee, and how Lord Bloodwall got his name, to be forever linked with that accursed wall. Next, we're going to cut some of these tiny nails with some wire cutters, and unless you cut them slowly, they'll shoot all over the place. Using two-part resin epoxy will get into our drilled holes. The epoxy sets in five minutes, so whatever you want to attach, you want to do it in close to around that time. It might sound counterintuitive, but you actually get a better bond that way. It's some sort of strange and dark sorcery. We're going to be using strips of drafting tape to hold the pieces in place while the epoxy sets. If you need something lightly held together, drafting tape is a pretty solid way to do it. I put a slight bend in the prongs of the crown, and here's what it looks like finished. I have another video that'll show you how I make poseable art doll hands, but for this character, I wanted to give him big, heavy metal gauntlets, so we'll sculpt some pieces onto her hands. I want the edge of the wrist part of the gauntlet to come to a point and sort of project forward. Next we'll add plating to the back of the hand and stretch and smooth it out. Now we can take our clay tool and ball stylus and work the plate piece into a point so it'll echo the way the wrist piece looks. Here we'll take a couple of little pieces of clay and sandwich it around the tips of the fingers. With our clay tool, we're going to work the fingertips into little talons. They're kind of long, curved teardrop shapes. And now Lord Bloodball's got some pretty badass looking gauntlets. Then we'll just give these a couple of quick coats of silver. And then give them a patina with a quick ink wash. In my sketch I drew his rope with this sort of metal spinal column looking piece going down the center. I'm planning on making a dedicated video on how it was made, but here's a little sneak peek. Using thread that blends into the metal trim, I sewed loops around each section of it, knotted off my thread, and repeated the process up the length of the trim. Here's the sleeve to the art doll's robes. We'll sew the narrower part around the shoulder and the more open end around where his hands are. The robes are also going to be trimmed with little blades all around the sleeves and bottom hem. So we use foam sheets to draw those shapes. You can see how I'm using a previously cut shape as a template to help me make the others a similar size, and then cut them out. We'll sand along the edges of the foam pieces to create a bevel form, meaning that it'll be thicker in the middle and gradually get thinner at the edges. Then you can use various tools to create scratches and other kinds of interesting textures. Now we'll do a couple of layers of paint on each side. I left the upper part of them unpainted on the underside, so we'll give a nice surface to attach to the robes. And we'll do an ink wash and wipe it away. Now their blades are ready to go, we'll adhere them to the robes with some Fabri-Tac. Lord Bloodwall is looking dapper in his finished robes, don't you think? We'll just attach this bladed mantle. 
It's another thing that was complicated enough that it should have its own video. We'll just close off these clasps that are made from pieces of braided wire. Next, we'll just dab on some red paint mixed with some resin epoxy to look like wet blood on a twig to make a creepy tree for the background. You know, as one does. Then we'll take some wooden skewers and turn them into spikes. We'll use tiny pieces of tinfoil, Fabri-Tac, and some Mod Podge to hold everything together and add some texture. One thing I want to show you, if you don't have one of these helping hands, which is pretty cool because it looks like a little robot person holding a spear. You can set up a couple of counter-facing clothespins when you need to set up something little and light like this aside to dry. Now we'll just paint these silver and give them an ink wash. Lord Bloodwall is also going to be holding this steel chalice. I imagined the bleed wall as looking like something between being mechanical and organic, so I found this aluminum conduit stuff that I could use as a base to build on top of. This stuff was incredibly hard to cut, and wire cutters alone weren't up to the task. In the background here, you can see everything that was involved in the effort to try and get these cut. Luckily, I only needed five pieces. What ultimately ended up being the most effective was using a small saw with a blade that's meant for sawing metal. My cuts were super jagged on the edges, which worked for my purposes. I guess there'd probably be some specialized tool for cutting stuff like this if you needed a clean edge. We'll attach pieces of tinfoil with several strips of paper tape. It initially used Fabri-Tac, but it was failing me and barely holding the foil onto the aluminum tubing. And we'll kind of paper mache it on with some Mod Podge. Once that's set up, we'll paint some of that silver onto the patches of tinfoil. This is going to be a background element, so it doesn't have to be a perfect match. You can see how well it does blend in, though. Next, we're going to twist up a bunch of pieces of wire in a couple of different sizes. I managed to cut myself a couple of times in the process, hence the band-aid. Who said art wasn't dangerous? And then we'll wrap some wire around parts of the tubing, helping to give it more of a metal vine kind of look. I arranged everything, made some final finishing touches, and photographed the scene. And this is the final result of Lord Bloodwall. If you're interested in a print, I'll put a link to where you can get one in the description and pinned comment. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to join me in making the imaginary reality, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Until next time, make believe.